Wonderful. Thank you, Jenny. That's such a kind introduction. So I'm really excited to talk to you here today about something that we've been studying about the maker movement. This is a broader movement that's been happening and kind of growing with this huge groundswell across the United States and, and even internationally as we move forward. And this year has been an important year because we've been able to bring the maker movement um, not only to the Bloomington community, but into the School of Education and onto campus. And so I want to share a little bit of kind of the innovation that's been happening and sort of invite you to take part in all of that uh, and share a little bit more about how that's changing the research around that how that's changing how we think about teaching and learning across all of our disciplinary areas and so the maker movement is really learning to make anything this is about building on all of the traditional crafts of yesteryear around sewing around shop around tech but it's also about having a high-tech spin to that um, so you've probably been watching the 3d printers um, you know the laser cutters all of these kinds of things come in and reinvent those industries but they're also reinventing the sciences reinventing what we know about literacy and reinventing what we know in the arts and so our access to those tools and materials becomes really really important to the way we think the way we learn the way we teach and so how do we start to prepare faculty how do we prepare students and important to the school of education how do we prepare pre-service teachers teachers that will be out in the field tomorrow um, to intersect with this equipment I think the important story here is that actually schools are already adopting this. This is a, a ground up movement that um, schools and, and um, you know, the library space here you're going to see in the Bloomington community, Wonder Lab, um, the Bloomington Project School already has a maker space in it. And so you can see it's, this means uh, thinking about science differently, thinking about traditional shop class and your cars differently, thinking about adding electronics to your study. So we've been trying to pull this over into the School of Education. Um, and you know, I kind of asked, like, you know, if the library has this new space um, in downtown, and our libraries even start to have this new space, and we've got all of our pre-service educators going into these spaces and trying to mentor youth, but they're kind of scared of the new machines. How in the School of Education can we start to address this need, but also address campus needs around trying to build capacity? Uh, many of you might be wondering, what would, I, what would I do in my own class with a 3D printer? And so we need to prepare to have um, answers to those questions. So we started with um, the mill here. This was uh, kind of a, an older lounge space that was cutting edge probably about a decade ago when the School of Education was built and it had all these cyber ports to it, um, but was being underutilized. It was kind of more of a nap space. And, <laughs> and so we started with this glass panel and we kind of got excited about it and, and we decided actually we needed the space next door to it. And so you can see this mini model here. We blew out the wall and we started transforming it uh, with the help of our former dean, Gerardo Gonzalez, and, and uh, you know, the really lovely architects. And it started to transform to something like this. And I'm going to show you a short little film here. And we've been bringing in um, laser cutters and 3D printers and Raspberry Pis and rethinking how the space is designed so that all of the tools and materials are really open. So this is like a science lab meets art studio space. And so I want to just show you a little bit of what this looks like in practice.
space is actually one of many spaces to actually come cross campus, but it's actually the first space to launch. So it's been really fun to think about it as the pilot space, but to also think about the space that can actually start to serve some of our educational needs on campus and in the surrounding community. And so you can see there we have um, an emphasis on high tech tools like laser cutters and, um, and uh, 3D printers and vinyl cutters and all sorts of things to come. But we also have an equal emphasis on things that might be uh, recognizable like sewing machines and traditional kinds of arts and crafts. Uh, so other efforts that are kind of related that you're starting to see here um, are happening at the library and the 3D printing services um, in which CWID and, and my, my own lab have been trying to support as well. Um, and so if you're interested in just trying out some prints and trying to get going on that, um, there's going to be next semester a series of workshops about faculty that are actually using these technologies, but also workshops and helping you to get started using those technologies. Everything from, from the really low end of how to get started, the very, very first print, and even understanding what 3D printing is, to moving towards you know kind of some of the high end stuff so you can start using it for your research. Many of the faculty in chemistry, for example, are starting to use these um, to create new models to actually run tests on the physical models that help them to refine um, their mm -hmm. formulas and their understanding. But moreover, these spaces start to really change the way we think about teaching and learning. That film was actually during one of our graduate courses. Um, and so we're starting to meet there uh, with our graduate students, with our undergraduate students, and with uh, field trips from the local schools and communities that actually come into that space. Uh, you know, the kids that just visited on Monday reported like they've never been so happier in their lives, right? <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> it is that kind of space that inspires creativity, that inspires you to tinker, to learn, to engage in both the sciences and the arts simultaneously. But it also allows us to rethink uh, many aspects of our own uh, research. And so I mentioned sort of the chemistry example. In my own research, I've been looking at how these tools and materials and this open access, think about how we store most of the stuff across campus. It's usually in a locked and contained cabinet that you can't see. In this space, you saw the open glass walls and sort of everything displayed on the wall, right? There is a key card entrance and we have to be secure and we have to think about those kinds of things. But we, it's also important to know the tools and materials that you have accessible, which is why the, the kids feel so, and engaged and so creative as they're in that space. I've been studying a smaller set of those materials um, for the past uh, five years or so, um, looking at e-textiles or electronic textiles, which are small um, electronics and wearable computers that can actually be bed embedded into clothing. And you see everybody from Lady Gaga to different healthcare applications to military applications taking up these e-textiles. Um, I've been working with a designer that's been taking these kinds of toolkits and making them really accessible to kids. And so this is the Lily Pat Arduino toolkit. And so uh, even Lady Gaga's dress is run on similar kinds of technologies that my second graders can actually use here. Um, and so this is really fun. This is a girl uh, sewing um, this little computer and a little LED light there into her t-shirt as her first design. And so the kids are actually able to make all sorts of different things like uh, backpacks with uh, with um, uh, rechargeable um, uh, solar cells to charge the batteries in their backpack, as you're seeing kind of here in the upper left corner, um, to these POV display bracelets that when you go in low light, you can actually see secret words revealed. And so it changes the kinds of robotics, the traditional kind of robotics projects that kids would normally engage with. Um, but it also changes some other things that we know about teaching and learning in high-tech environments. First thing we're starting to see is how, when we change the technology, that you can actually start to change participation. So if you know the STEM pipeline, you know the technology stuff, you know that girls are traditionally underrepresented, um, more underrepresented in computer science fields than in STEM fields more broadly, um, and in engineering as well. And so uh, the traditional Arduino robotics platform is like the kind of cutting edge hobbyist platform. And when we had looked at like kind of who was using these kinds of materials, overwhelmingly um, they were male. And so you can see 86% of the users, the hobbyist users, were, were male and 1% female. Vice versa, when we use the same hardware and the same software to code, right? And, but we change it a little bit so that you can actually sew into it with this conductive thread instead of soldering or plugging into it with your traditional um, Arduino robotics, you start to see that the community is 65% female, the first ever female-dominated community. So we asked ourselves, 
you know, did we start to see the same kinds of patterns in the classroom? Um, normally, if you're aware of kind of that research, what happens is that the, the girls will kind of stand back and kind of hold a material. They'll be supportive, they'll be leaning in, they'll be excited about it, but they'll get very little hands-on access, which translates to a lack of identity and a lack of affiliation with, with the electronics, but it also translates to a lack of learning, right? And so by having hands-on participation, we learn that. So we try strategies like having girls-only clubs, things like that. But when we change these tools and materials, we actually see the inverse, is the boys end up standing behind and the girls end up doing the leadership. The boys are equally engaged, they want the project to continue, they're advising. This is true even when the boys have more sewing experience than the girls. So these tools aren't just about changing participation patterns, although they do that, they rupture everything that it is that we know. But they also have um, an impact on how we think about deepening learning. And so the girls are attracted to the things that are more aesthetic and more uh, theoretically compelling. And so you can see here, these are kids that have learned about traditional um, circuitry with the traditional materials on the left-hand side. This is a, a typical pretest result. If you know much about circuitry, you know this circuit won't work. Even though he's just learned about in school how to make a circuit operate, he can't transfer it to these tools and materials. Um, and he doesn't even know it, he thinks he does. And by the post-test results, we're found, we had found that the e-textiles is a more um, effective means of, of getting to a simple circuitry, and the kids were able to demonstrate their understanding of all the big ideas of circuitry, that even our undergrads that are going into um, uh, computer science or going into um, uh, engineering fields or physics that need the strong foundation that feel like they have it actually don't have this solid understanding at the undergraduate level and this has been true since the 1970s or so but what we found actually was that it's because of the tools and materials the tools and materials make you think in certain ways that prevent you from understanding the conceptual content so you can see this here that the hand to mind um, group is the second one from the left here <clears throat> this is the traditional tools and materials that are used in classrooms. And the other four are the things that are kind of starting to come out of the new maker movement that kind of get us to think about new materials and the way we think about traditional circuitry. So this is a, a controlled study where we gave all of the kids one of these kits by random, and we said train and understand circuits for 90 minutes with your instructor, and we had a very controlled form of instruction. And we gave them a pretest and a post-test where we asked them to draw a circuit with all of these materials. And so what we wondered was, if you trained in one, if you trained in e-textiles, could you apply that understanding to the other four kits? And if you trained in hand to mind, could you apply that understanding to the other kits? And so what you're seeing is the pre to post difference depending on the kit that you started with, right? And this is, this is a large group of students. This is, this is uh, you know, probably close to 50 students in each group. And we have, um, you can see that the e-textiles group better prepared the youth to transfer that understanding. And so that it's not just about the instruction, it's about the tools and materials being aligned with the conceptual content that allow us to embody that understanding and to learn it long term. Mm -hmm. So we've been building on this and kind of thinking about how we can start to build um, new curricular materials and textbooks to help bridge this gap. And so we actually have a lot of undergraduate um, faculty you know, using this new uh, series that we have from MIT Press, um, pre-service uh, for pre-service classrooms as well as um, you know, folks that are, that are working with uh, the computer science groups um, starting to adopt um, these new tools and materials as we move forward. So I encourage you to stay in touch with us to learn more about um, the mill space and kind of how, uh, you know, we'd love to kind of give you a tour as we go open. We just literally had the Little Open Cutting Ceremony the week before Thanksgiving. And so uh, we're just, you know, still stocking the space and rolling it out as we move forward. Um, and so we have regular tours and so forth that we'd love to invite you to participate in. Thank you. <laughs>